appreciate it. Um, there, there's really kind of two themes that I'd like to talk through today and, and really kind of reflect on my life and, and um, kind of observe how powerful they have been in my life personally. And so one of those is culture, and so we'll, we'll dig into that quite a bit. And the second one of those is life transitions, right? We all face life the transitions within our life, whether it be moving to a new city, taking on a new job, entering a new relationship, right? Those are all life transitions. And, and culture really comes into play in those life transitions. So before we get started, though, you guys have your phones? Let's get this, let's get embarrassment out of the way quickly here. I just sent a uh, text to the Culture Center. So, did y'all get that? So that is, that is uh, 12 year old me. And uh, if a picture could sum up a childhood, that's, that's a pretty good one. So yes, I am holding two dead snakes uh, that, that I had uh, previously killed. Um, what you're seeing behind me is the pond that was at my house growing up. Um, and so get into my, my childhood just a little bit, but um, was raised in uh, Katy, Texas, which is outside of Houston. Uh, my parents had four acres there. And honestly, it was a pretty magical childhood, pretty magical youth. Um, as I mentioned, we had that pond there, and our, our land was next to the Buffalo Bio, which a bio is another word for a river or creek, if you will. And on that bio, all these snakes would always come in, and they would come into our pond. If we left like a door open, a snake would get into your house. Like I remember walking in one morning to my bathroom, and there was a snake, its tail was curled around my toothbrush, and it was up and over the mirror. Um, and so, so my mom obviously hated these snakes and you know, was worried about all of us, and so she gave me permission to shoot them all. And so I, I had quite fun running around with my pellet gun most, most days and, and shooting snakes. Uh, if you'll notice in the picture, the heads of the snakes have been removed. And a little, little fun fact there, after you kill a snake, they can still bite you for up to an hour. And so we made that a process to eliminate that variable. But um, <coughs> we were out in the country uh, within Katy, and so didn't have a lot of neighborhood friends that I hung out with. And so um, I have one sister, and she was a, she is, still is to this day, a bit of a bookworm. And so most days she would be inside with her, her nose buried in a book, and I would be outside running around in nature and, and having a good time. Um, we had every animal you can imagine, uh, dogs galore, cows, horses, uh, guineas, peacocks. Um, my, um, my mom, still to this day, is probably one of the most kind people I've ever met. Um, I know you guys have been talking about core memories, you know, a little bit. One of my very first core memories, um, I don't remember how old I was, but I was in the back seat of our car, and it was, it was night, it was dark out. And um, it was Christmas Eve, and we were in the bad part of town, the poor part of town. And I, I can still vividly picture my mom. Um, we have a load of presents in the back, and she's, she's getting these presents out and taking it to these people's house because they had been going through a really hard financial time. They were her students. My mom was a teacher. And their kids weren't going to have Christmas, right? And so I can remember my mom you know, getting these presents out and ushering them into the house so that when the kids woke up, they would have Christmas. And um, I, I still remember she was floating. I mean, just biggest smile on her face. She was just, that, that's what she was made to do, right, was, was things like that. And she absolutely instilled in us, put others first, put others above yourself, right? That was part of our core DNA. Um, my mom died uh, about six, seven years ago at this point. Um, my dad, uh, obviously still alive down in, in Georgetown, which is just north of Boston, um, exceedingly kind man. Um, I never really got in trouble as a kid. I, I just, I was happy. I did what they asked and I didn't, there was really not a need <laughs> for me to get in trouble. Um, he worked a lot and so, um, you know, I knew work was very important to him. He worked in like downtown Houston and so he had like an hour drive there and an hour drive back and so, I didn't see him a ton, but um, I do know, like as an example, he still made time to coach my basketball league, right? Every, every year from like age seven to like age 12, he coached my basketball team. And so, um, you know, the, 
I say this kind of jokingly and kind of not, the, the worst thing I can honestly say about my parents is they spoiled me, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's a, that feels good when you're a kid, you know, it produces some different things a little bit later that you, uh, you have to learn to deal with. But, um, and so I, I want to talk about the culture of my family a little bit, right? It, um, you know, respecting others above yourself, right? I mentioned that that was a, a key part of that, um, of, of me growing up, uh, very loving, very supportive, um, you know, encouraging people to do their best, that, that kind of mindset, um, very focused on do the right thing. My mom would always say, you know, we would get a gift and I would have to write thank you notes afterwards and give, give thank you notes. And well, why do we do that mom? Cause it's the right thing to do. It's like, okay. You know, um, but the, the one thing I'll say about the culture in my family is we didn't really talk about real things, right? We, and I'll give you some examples, but um, even our relationship with God growing up, right? I, somebody would pray before every meal, and when we prayed as a, as a child, it was God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, right? That was, our, that was the prayer. When I would go to bed, I would pray, you know, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to, t you know, just, just canned prayers, right? And we would go to church on Sunday, and then we would come out of church and not really talk about what happened to church, right? It, and, and so again, it was a very kind of arm's length, you know, I don't really know what that's about, but we do it because it's the right thing. And um, another example, you know, my parents, when I was like 10 or 11, they uh, ran into some really hard financial times and actually ended up declaring bankruptcy, right? I didn't know that until I was in my 30s, right? My, my parents just never discussed those kinds of things. I never once saw my parents fight, right? They very loving towards each other, always got along, and I'm, I'm sure they had disagreements like all marriages do, but that was always done, you know, behind closed doors. Um, and so again, not, not you know, the first time my dad and I had a honest conversation about God, I was 19, right? And so very interesting kind of culture. And so, um, you know, one of the, the life transitions I want to talk about. So my mom, she was a teacher at my elementary school. And so elementary school is like age, you know, six, five to six to like 11, right? That's, that's elementary school in Texas. Um, and so my mom was a teacher there. And so every year I always had the best teacher, right, for that grade, because my mom would make sure that that happened behind the scenes. And all my friends, she would make sure, and these were the good friends, right, would, she would make sure they were in my class with me, right? And so that, that was my life, you know, for that elementary school age. And so honestly, that was a, it was very, a very peaceful time, right? I, I loved elementary school, it was a lot of fun. I had great teachers, everybody was nice to me. Um, and then that transition from going from elementary school to junior high, right? And Cheryl alluded to this in her testimony as well. Um, I, you know, I, I wanna really talk about that transition and, and what that looked like in my life. Um, you know, again, so the, the way this works is, I, you know, I was in an elementary school and we go to a junior high, but there's actually four or five elementary schools that feed the same junior high. Does that make sense? So now all of a sudden your class size is a lot bigger. There's a whole bunch of new people that you haven't met before. You know, some of them are from, you know, very, very different parts of town, right? We, we now all of a sudden had a lot of, of lower economic people in our class. We also had exceedingly rich people in, in our junior high versus what I was used to before was kind of people like me that were out in the country, right? That was kind of our people. And so it's this massive collision of cultures, right? Kind of coming together. And so um, I, I remember, you know, one of my, my very first days of junior high, I, um, at the time, I loved, and I still do, I really enjoy sports. And so uh, I played basketball, played football, and, um, and so that became kind of my circle of friends, right, was all the athletic people. And so that, that there is a culture within that, that group. And I, I remember one of the first days of junior high, I'm standing outside of the gymnasium, and there's probably like 15 of us, and some of you guys have heard this story, but uh, somebody made a joke, right? And the, the joke had a cuss word in it. Um, I, I didn't know what that cuss word meant, right? And so I just asked, like, what, what does that mean, right? And 
in that culture, that was a horribly wrong thing to do, right? You, uh, the, the laughing started at that point, the mocking started at that point, and I realized like very, very quickly, like, okay, I don't know what's going on here. Like, well, I don't know why I couldn't even ask that question, right? Um, and so at that point, I, you know, I, I realized, okay, this is, this is very different than I'm used to. I don't understand it, and I can't ask questions, right? So what, what do you do in that, in that mode? You, you, you learn to observe, right? And very, very early, God put this in me, this observation of culture, right? And I, I'll tell you guys, when I moved here, it was one of the reasons I was immediately drawn is because I saw the culture of this group and this community, and I knew it was real. Um, and so in that in that community, that, that little athletic group there, right, I started to observe things. And so I started to observe, you know, basic things. How do we dress in this, in this culture, right? There's a very specific way to dress. How do we talk to one another, right? As Cheryl even mentioned in hers, we, we, I learned a brand new vocabulary, right, of all kinds of words that probably I shouldn't learn, right? But uh, you learn, and, and so what are you, what are you observing there? Um, you know, it's really this, this concept of social norms, right? How do you, how do you treat each other? It, it, or do you build each other up in this environment or do you tear people down? And so in that environment, again, I observe very quickly, no, this isn't an, an environment where you encourage each other, where you build each other up. This is an environment where you tear people down, right? Does that make sense? And so you, you just start to piece this together. You look at how decisions are made in this particular culture, right? Somebody, as an example, shows up and they're wearing a new shirt. And you start to look around and you say, is that shirt gonna be a cool shirt? Or are people gonna make fun of that shirt, right? And you can see various opinions within the group that you're, you're, you're uh, interacting with. And you can start to see a social hierarchy right of oh that person thinks that the shirt is cool therefore that person holds power and so you start to observe all these social norms what are these social norms based in they're based in values right they, they all all of us of every culture we're a part of whether we know it or not we share values and so again let's talk about what culture actually is for a minute you know you can use the term even microculture to start to think about some of this but anytime two people are in a relationship with one another, they're interacting with one another, just two. Can be three, can be four, can be a million. But it starts with just two. You have a culture, right, that you, when you are interacting with somebody, you, you, you share some values, right, and those values can be good things, those values can be bad things. You, how are we gonna go get something to eat? How's that decision made? right, of where we're gonna go to eat, right? That, that you're working that out in the culture of the two of you. <coughs> and in, in these life transitions that we're talking about, you know, from elementary to middle school, you know, and thinking about like Benji and Elijah going to self-start right now, right? There's a culture in that college, right? I'm sure you guys have already observed it. You know, I don't know the details of it, but you know, my, my coaching here, or my, my ask is to start to observe these things, especially in times of life transition. Right? When you're introduced to a new group of people, start to, to see them, right? Start to understand them. And so, you know, the values I noticed about this group, right? What did they, what did they think was important? Winning, first and foremost, I, I observed. Winning was very, very important in that culture. It's a sports-based culture, so that makes sense, right? But I think we've, we've all observed or been part of, they would turn anything into a competition. Right? Anything we could make a competition, they would turn it into a competition. And, and it wasn't so much, you know, winning is certainly fun, but I think it's more important in that culture. I win, which means therefore you lose. Right? And that's probably actually more fun to me, is that you're losing, and that not, not necessarily even that I'm winning. Right? And so winning was very important. I also observed stuff was very important. What I mean by stuff, at that, at that time, fancy shoes, right? You brought a pair of Air Jordans there, right? Nike basketball shoes, your, your social score just went up, right? Because we value stuff in that culture. And you can, you can start to observe that, you know, 
values, what is, what, is, what is something that people flock to when it's introduced into the environment, right? There will be a time when Elaine has her baby, right? And she will walk through that door with that baby. And I can guarantee you, every single woman in this room will sprint <laughs> to that door, right? Why? Because we value that. That's important to us. And so you can see that here. I guarantee you, if I brought a new pair of Jordans in, everybody's going to run. Let me see those things, man. Because that's important. It's a value in there. And you start to see, you know, um, what, what's not important in here is relationships. Right? There, there's no value in that, the, the culture that I'm speaking of with relationships. Right? They're not a consideration. And so it becomes winning. It becomes stuff. You know, power becomes a big one in this. And you start, you start to feel out of their values, and then it explains the decisions that they're making. Right? Does that make sense? And so what I realized here is, is in this culture, really what all this kind of adds up to is perfection. Right? That's really the standard that was in that environment. And if you're not perfect, you don't have value. Right? And so that, that's the big lie that, that I started to believe in this culture. And how, how does that lie take root? It, the lie shows up with a feeling of, I'm not good enough. Right, and, and when you see that and you feel that I'm not good enough, the, the interesting thing is, you know, I can remember talks with my mom about, you know, self-confidence, right, and dealing, and you are good enough, you are good enough. In, in this environment, you're actually not good enough, right? That's, you're not believing a lie when you believe you're not good enough in this environment because perfect is the standard, right? And so what, what you're actually doing, though, the lie, and it's, it's so deceivious, is that by participating in this culture, as Justin had alluded to, you're giving them permission to set your standard. Right? And your standard in this type of environment is that your value as a human has to be earned. Right? And if you fall short of that perfection, you have no value to that group, right? Oh, you, you're on a sports team and you missed a, a shot to win the game? Man, you're worthless to me. You, you did something last week that was really cool and so you were cool a week ago? Well, today you tripped down the stairs. <laughs> now I get to laugh at you, right? And so, again, by participating in this type of culture, you're giving them permission to set your standard. And that, that that to me is a, um, was, a, was a really big takeaway in my life and seeing that. And honestly, that's a hook that once it gets in you that I've got to earn my value as a, as a person, it, it's really hard to get out of. Right? It, it's really hard to get that off of you, right? Versus understanding your identity in God and what that, as a son of God, and understanding that, that that is the value, right? It doesn't matter how I perform. It doesn't matter that I'm not perfect. It doesn't matter that I've lost. It doesn't matter that I made a mistake. My value still holds, right? And so, anyway, this, this theme of cultures and that, that transition in particular from elementary school to middle school or junior high was, was really, really insightful for me and, and something obviously that I wasn't prepared for. But these life transitions happen all the time. You know, another one was uh, Kim and I getting married, right? When we, we again, your, your family right now has a culture in that family. When you have two, two families coming together in marriage, you now have two cultures colliding. Right? And you guys have to figure out, as husband and wife, what your culture is going to be in your house. And just like I look at my parents' culture and what that was able to produce, good and bad, right? 
we, we should be evaluating the culture in our, in our marriages, in our families, right? and seeing what those cultures end up producing. Kim and I really, really struggled with that, right? The, the culture in the Fry family, what I grew up in, very, 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 very different than the culture than, than the Pinson family. It was, a, it was a true collision of cultures. And, and not having the right lens to be able to just recognize that and give yourself freedom and permission to, oh, we've got to figure this thing out, right? That humble heart, that being a student that Emmanuel was just alluding to. Very, very important, very, very difficult to do, but you give yourself grace by just seeing, oh, this is a, this is a problem that we need to come together and figure out, right? It's not one versus the other at that point. And so um, that's, that's really what I wanted to, wanted to share today. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. There are, yeah, anyway, I'll just leave it there. Any, any questions? It's okay if you don't have any. Uh-oh. What, what do you think, you talked about values in the former culture. What, do you think, what would you say are some values that you see now in the culture that God's given you here? Yeah, I, um, I think relationships, it, again, I go back to, it, is a huge one, right? I mean, I think, you know, God chooses to, to manifest himself in our lives, right? And being able to, you know, one, grow together in, in that pursuit, but two, see God in other people, right? Um, you know, when, when you view relationships through that lens, it takes on a completely different meaning. Um, respect and honor is another, uh, are other huge parts of culture that I see here. You know, I, coming here, um, it had been a long while in my life that people actually cared what I had to say, right? The, the, the culture out there and in the world is, I'm most important, it's based in self, I'm trying to make myself look cool, and so I talk and I talk and I talk and I step on you if you try to talk and I'm gonna get louder than you if I need to, to step on you. And so even a simple thing of, asking a question of me of my opinion and then waiting to hear the answer that's you don't understand that but that's different that is vastly different than what is out in the world right putting each other's needs above your own and that was one my mom absolutely got right right and putting me very young but i absolutely see it in this culture and even just being with one another when you're going through suffering right you know again this this concept of death to self, that, that all of this, this journey that we're on, you know, in, in part it liberates you from yourself. And when you're liberated from yourself, you can start to see others and you can start to help others. The world is not death to self, right? You know, if, if I'm going into to surgery with Kim and I tell people at work, hey, i uh, got, a, got a big surgery with my wife, so I'm gonna be out a couple days. When I come back, does anybody ask me how, how the surgery went? Not a one, right? Because they don't remember. They don't care. They're all wrapped up in their own self. And so that those are some of the things that were, were very different to me. I was actually just talking to Haley yesterday. I won't get into the context why, but it's time to start revealing these differences to mm -hmm. our precious young people because God is giving and has given such a loving, not perfect, mm -hmm. but love-filled environment for you all to start in. And, you know, there is a time when it is important to realize that there <coughs> is not usually that environment for mm -hmm. a young life to start in. And, you know, there is a time when it when it comes time to realize that and to face that. It's 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 sad. It's a shame. Mm -hmm. You know, we want the best for every young life, but for our young lives here, to hear that most other young lives are not surrounded with a loving environment mm -hmm. is such a vital equipping, um, you know, for us to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and so. 
I think that opens our hearts and compassion. And it also, I think, brings glory to God because it, it reveals the strength that he is, is building. Um, and then, and then there, there's the time to share that strength and, and to, to shine and mm-hmm. to love and to give out of that established foundation that's been built. Mm-hmm. But I just hear a common theme here, you know, in what you're sharing today. And I think that it's exciting. Yeah, there, there's, thank you for that. I completely agree. And, you know, there's, there's kind of two ways to, to look at this. You know, one is we are all tempted by the world at some point in our life. We are, right? The things of the world can, can be appealing in our eyes, right? Whether for, for guys that looks like fancy houses and big cars and vice versa there. But, um, you know, for the ladies, I'm not sure the, the women will have to guide you on that, but at a, at a certain point, you are going to be tempted, right? And you, you have to understand what, if you, if you give in to that and you choose to participate to that, you're, you, you're giving them permission to set your standard, right? And, and living under this standard, it's a roller coaster. It is an absolute roller coaster. Um, and so that, that is kind of one way to look at this. The second is exactly what you were saying, Cheryl, right? Which is, we are going to be in the world, right? When you walk out of this building, you are in the world. You, you guys are now in a, in a college that is of the world, right? We, we want you to still thrive in that environment, <coughs> right? And, and the, the first way to be able to do that is to just at least start to see it for what it is, right? But some of these life transitions that God's going to bring your way, they're going to be challenging. It's not going to be in this greenhouse that we have here. It's going to be out in the world, which can sometimes be a very, very harsh place. All right? And so, you know, we would be remiss if we did not start to give you tools to be able to deal with life out in the world when you're out there, right? It's interesting. Uh, this is something I observed is that I've been talking about this, like, critical inner voice that a lot of us have, I think especially in our family, mm-hmm. that's something that is very prevalent just in the way that we think of ourselves and especially our shortcomings. Yep. But that's that culture that you were talking about is where that voice comes from. Absolutely right. Because it's it's being programmed into you and drilled into you because it's perfection yep. that they're looking for. Mm-hmm. And of course every single day, every moment of every single day you are falling short of that. Yep. So you begin to see yourself in this very condemning mm-hmm. light, and it's damaging. Yeah. And so in this greenhouse, that's what's kind of being reprogrammed and rewired yep. in a lot of us, mm-hmm. is there, there is a, a balance there. Of, sure, you have to be critical of yourself, but there's a difference between critical and condemning. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to be patient with yourself and mm-hmm. give yourself some credit every once in a while. And you- that's what <laughs> this relationship between each other mm-hmm. is helpful with. Absolutely. Um, you guys familiar with growth mindset? Yes. yes. Justin shared on it. I'm not seeing enough nodding. Just kidding. No, yeah, that, that um, the growth, it, it reminded me of the growth mindset, right? But, but for me, right, I know growth mindset is kind of a big, big topic, but for me, kind of understanding the growth mindset and starting to live it, there was such freedom in it. Right. This world demands that you be a perfect person right this very second. Right. And if you're not, then you're a failure. Right. There's no if, and buts about it. Right. Growth mindset for me gives me permission to know I'm not a finished product yet. Right. And so even I know you last week you guys talked about criticism. Right. Even in your ability to receive criticism with the growth mindset, it's great. I'm not a finished product yet. I'm getting better every single solitary day. I have setbacks. But you just offered me something that will help me take that next step. But it, there's such freedom there and knowing I don't have to be perfect. Right? That's okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, uh, if you don't mind Please? maybe explaining how, um, how it was for you to come out of the transition, not even necessarily as a kid mm-hmm. in this culture, but like even moving here from a different culture, I would assume, mm-hmm. uh, is in Texas than it was moving here. Can you maybe explain a little more, like, how, I guess, sorry, I don't know how to explain it, um, how that was for you, like, coming in with the transition, and if it was, like, hard, or 
Did you find it easier or something? You talking about coming here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, there's, I'll take a step back for a second. I really prayed a lot and struggled a lot with the testimony that I was going to share today because there are parts of my life that are exceedingly dark, right? And I'll be honest, I don't know how to talk about those yet, right? I, I don't want to glorify those things, but I also, some of them are very real and they're very ugly. And I don't know quite how to talk about those, just being honest. And so I decided I'm not going to. Um, but t to answer your question, I was in a very, very dark place before the move here. And I can remember sitting in my office and just reaching this point where I was like, I wasn't even necessarily praying, I was just like talking out loud. But I was like, I can't do this anymore. Just meaning about life. Like, I, I just can't do this anymore. And I literally said out loud, like, you're gonna have to send someone because I just can't, I can't do this, you know? And um, boy, like months, maybe even weeks after that particular situation, the wheels started to turn for us to move here. And, and I, was, I was all for it, you know? Um, a lot of that was, um, it's, it's sometimes very simple things that speak profoundly, but I think uh, Tim had come to Austin uh, Jr. previously, and I think, it, I think you were with him on that trip, but I, I have to ask our historian Isaac over there the specific ones of it, but um, th this is so simple, but it'll help illustrate the point. You know, we, we were living in this, this really nice house, and um, there, was, there were these, there was something about the house, there were these like blue boxes that were up kind of way up high, and they just looked ugly and horrible. And every time I saw them, I just felt like, ugh, right? And like, just, it, it, it almost like reflected failure on me that we had these big blue boxes just sitting up there and they were ugly and they just like ate at you. You ever have small things like that that just eat at you? Anyway, Tim came into town and without even asking, he just painted them, right? And I remember like thinking, there's something different about that. Like what on earth? Like, like it, it touched me, right? Like in a deeper way than I expected. And so, anyway, my point is coming here, there was things pulling me, right? That, that I, was, I was very excited for the move. I was in a very bad spot. I think our family wasn't necessarily the healthiest. Um, and so coming here, and you know, God I think also uses other things, but there's a, there's a TV show that, that um, I, know, I know Justin has watched as well, but one of the lines in it is, be curious, not judgmental. Right, and uh, that show really <clears throat> resonated with me. I just liked a lot of things about it. Um, and you know, when I moved here, just being real, right, I, I, I had heard about all, all the visions over the years, right? And you kidding me? There was a cloud with an arrow, and they're going to follow that? Like, are these guys nuts? Right? I'm just being real, right? I mean, those were thoughts that had crossed my mind, and and I, I really felt that I was going to embrace that. I'm going to be curious about this. Right? I don't know anything. I, what I do know is that my life has led me to that point in that office where I'm saying I can't do this anymore. Right? I just flat out can't do it. And so what do I know about anything? Right? And so be curious. Right? I just approached it from a place of I'm going to be curious about this and see what it is. You know, maybe maybe it, it resonates with me, maybe it doesn't. But I'm certainly willing to try because where I was, mm -mm. I don't want to be there anymore, thank you. Um, and so honestly, when, you know, I think, God has, has showed me after that, you know, he, he kind of obviously orchestrated my, my heart position coming in, but that was a pretty good heart position to, yeah. to be able to, to receive him and hear from him. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah. Just after what Isaac shared and then you're adding now, and I, when Isaac was sharing, I was thinking um, in that interface, <laughs> you know, that we struggle with, and then considering that my sheep know my voice, mm -hmm. and even what you just shared about even being in such a dark place, and questioning, you know, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, considering the struggles that, that the Lord has brought you through your entire life. Mm -hmm. But being a sheep, you know, you've yep. heard the Father's voice. Mm -hmm. And even seeing the goodness of the Lord, whether you realized at the time that it was Him or not, mm -hmm. you know, led you to where you are today. Yeah, so, for sure. Justin was asking about, you know, the culture here. And I, I can remember, you know, this was maybe, I don't know, a few months after I moved here. But... I didn't know it at the time that God brought this this verse to my head. I just thought I happened to think of it. But anyway, I happened to think of this verse, 
Um, and it, you know, it, it's in John, and it, it's talking about Jesus' disciples, and he says, you will know them, the disciples, by their love for one another, right? And when I looked around this community, I was like, they love one another, and they love me, right? I mean, my sister was asking me, you know, on a recent trip, kind of just about my life here, and that was like the number one thing out of my mouth. I was like, they love me, you know? And that's rare. That's exceedingly rare, guys. Don't, don't. Don't blow that off as if it's nothing, because it's not. It's absolutely not. It's a gift. Can you go ahead. Who is that? Can you hear me okay? We can now. Questions, observations, anything else? Turn it back over to you, sir. Thank you, those who ask questions. I dislike talking about myself. Those questions made that easier. <laughs>